seeking the approval of God alone. Yes, we must be open to valid criticism and correction that is factual and supported by God's Word, not only in order to please men, but God alone. We must be careful not to be defensive of our own reputations. All that matters is God's will and glory, and what God and Christ will pronounce upon one's life in that rapidly oncoming moment of ultimate truth. This fact, together with a constant awareness of God's love and care, provide the motivation and direction for the way in which we must use our fast diminishing moments on this earth. We neither seek the praise of men nor fear their rebuke. It is the Lord only whom we serve, seeking to follow His word and to please Him alone. Yes, we must be the servants of all, Mark 10.44, Hebrews 3.5, but we do it for the Lord's sake, 1 Peter 2.13, not as men-pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, Ephesians 6.6. 6. To the extent that we serve men for the rewards they offer, God is not real to us. What folly to barter away an eternal reward in exchange for anything this brief life and its temporary bankrupt tenants can offer. Even the Latin poet Juvenal, from a humanistic standpoint, wrote, quote, Consider it the greatest of crimes to prefer survival to honor and, out of love of physical life, to lose the very reason for living, unquote. Christ rebuked the Pharisees with these words, How can ye believe, that is, be men of faith, which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. John 5.44 Why can't we receive honor both from man and God? For a number of reasons. Christ said it is impossible to serve two masters, especially God and mammon, that is, riches and worldly reward. Matthew 6.24 Those who attempt to do so find their hearts torn and consciences dulled as the things of this life and opinions of men proved to be more real than is God himself. Tragically, we can be blind to the truth about our real motives because our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17.9 What Christian has not experienced praying in public and wondering within himself whether those listening realize what a great prayer is being offered? Who has not done something virtuous, kind, and seemingly selfless for the good of others and at the same time Hope that such service was noticed and admired by men. Such folly is only possible because men and their opinions loom larger than God. If God and all of His infinite power and love were real to us, the opinions of men, either for or against us, and the honor or dishonor they may bestow, would shrink into nothingness in comparison. And as God becomes real, we inevitably fear Him. This is not the fear of one who is terrorized. It is a fear out of respect, the reverent awe which is becoming of us as creatures in the presence of our Creator, no matter how confident we are of His love and the acceptance we have in Christ. And is not this sense of awe too often lacking among those who gather in most churches? Are not we generally more aware of one another than of God? We receive so many letters from Christians who are having a difficult time finding a church where the Lord is really worshipped in spirit and in truth, John 4.24, and His Word is honored. Of course, part of the fault could lie with those who can't find a, quote, suitable fellowship, unquote. However, the fact that this same cry is so often heard from all over the world indicates that there must be some truth in it. Who would dare to say that Christians in general and most churches are living up to the standards set forth in the New Testament? Yet we claim to study and know the New Testament, and pastors and teachers preach from it. How many of us have lost that glow of excitement and fervent love of Christ which characterized us when we were first saved? What went wrong? One could point to a variety of causes. How many Christians spend as much time in prayer and Bible study as they do watching television? Has not television brought the world's values into our homes? Christians are to be in the world, but not of the world. If we took an honest look at ourselves, would we perhaps see that many of us have become of the world to an extent that would alarm us if our eyes were open to discern it? 
Would the rapture, if it suddenly occurred, interrupt plans and ambitions that have lowered our affection from the heavenly to the earthly? Is it possible that somehow those of us who claim to be Christians have lost the sense of the awesomeness of God's person and presence? Could it be that church has become something we do with and even for one another rather than for God alone, a pattern of going together through the same routine each week which involves motions acceptable to man rather than the worship of God? Do we act as though we are in the presence of God himself, the infinitely powerful and holy and all-knowing creator of the universe, who holds our breath in his hand? Or do we act as though we are attempting to impress and please and even entertain one another? So what should we do? Try to feel the presence of God or visualize him or Christ? The destructiveness of the emotionalism and occultism resulting from such techniques has been dealt with in depth both in my books and newsletter, so it will not be repeated here. Then how does God become real to us? Do we step out into nature and contemplate the wonders of his universe? That can be a legitimate part of bowing in wonder before God, which many psalms present to us. Psalm 8, 3, 19, 1, 104, 24. But mysticism and emotionalism can overtake us there as well. Without understanding and obeying his word, which reveals his character and will, we would be deceived. Therein lies another problem plaguing the church, lack of discernment and accountability to God's word. Only the fear of the Lord will deliver us from the fear of man, from the deceit of our own hearts, and from the snare of unbiblical alliances. One often hears the naive expression, quote, I embrace all those as brethren who love Jesus and name the name of Christ, unquote. Yet many cultists profess to love Jesus, and almost all name the name of Christ. One must discern what is meant by such words.